Hey, welcome to the introduction of the nervous system produced specifically for human physiology. So if you have already taken human anatomy, this is going to feel like a very simplified review and it will be because this is anatomy light. In physiology, uh, we spend most of our time talking about how specialized cells in the nervous system called neurons uh, conduct their electrical signals down the length of the cell and then once they get to the end of that cell how they might communicate with another cell. So that's where we're going to be spending most of our time but in this mini lecture we are going to cover the organization of the nervous system just to make sure that everybody is up to speed and then we'll introduce the cells that comprise the nervous system. So let's get started. So anatomically, if we take a look at the nervous system, we can break it down into two parts. The central part, which runs along the center of your body, that comprises the brain and spinal cord, and it is known as the central nervous system. And then there's everything else. Well, everything else is mostly branching off the spinal cord and the brain. Those are going to be your nerves. If they are branching off your brain, those are called cranial nerves. If they're branching off your spinal cord, those are called spinal nerves. And so those comprise the peripheral nervous system. Now the phrase peripheral nervous system is based on this idea of periphery. If you know what that word means, it means kind of on the outside. So we have the center and then we have everything else kind of on the outside, which is the peripheral nervous system. Next, we're going to look at an organizational flow chart of sorts that breaks down the nervous system for us. I encourage you to get out a pen or a pencil and take notes as we go through this flow chart. So as I mentioned previously, the nervous system is broken up into the central nervous system, which is abbreviated CNS, and the uh, peripheral nervous system, which is abbreviated PNS. And I have learned the importance of enunciating every letter in those initials. If you do not, you say a different word. So make sure when you speak it, you enunciate P and S with a pause. Okay, so the central nervous system, as we know, is comprised of the brain and the spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system uh, is the, mostly the nerves. So when we open up one of those nerves, we're going to find a bunch of long cells in there that are called neurons. And we'll be getting into how to draw a neuron in a little bit. But those neurons um, are functionally broken down into two types. One type is called the afferent neuron, and another type is called an efferent neuron. And when I say we break them down functionally, what I mean is they do different things. Afferent neurons are responsible for bringing information from the body to the central nervous system. You would associate this most often with sensory information. So afferent neurons are going to bring in sensory information like touch, pressure, heat, pain, uh, body positioning, muscle tension into the central nervous system. And then if the central nervous system decides to do something about that sensory information, it may direct a response back to the body. The responses are relayed via efferent neurons. So the flow of information is afferent neuron brings information into the central nervous system. The central nervous system decides if it wants to do something about it and then sends information back out through the efferent neurons. Now very often, because afferent is most often associated with sensory, sometimes afferent neurons are used synonymously with the phrase sensory neurons. Likewise, very often the response is some sort of muscle contraction. So efferent neurons are often used synonymously with motor neurons, which refers to um, motor function, which means movement. So now that we've looked at the different types of neurons, breaking them down functionally, let's go back to our organization and look at how the peripheral nervous system is broken down into further subdivisions. So the peripheral nervous system is further broken down into two subdivisions known as the somatic nervous system 
and the autonomic nervous system. Now the somatic nervous system is most often associated with voluntary movement. And so by and large, the somatic nervous system is going to control muscle contractions, not just any type of muscle, but specifically skeletal muscles. So again, if you've had anatomy, you know that there's actually three different types of muscle tissue. They are skeletal muscle tissue, cardiac muscle tissue, and smooth muscle tissue. And so skeletal muscle tissue is responsible for moving your skeleton and therefore responsible for movement. Because most skeletal movements are voluntary, in other words, if I say pick up a pencil, you say, okay, I'm gonna pick up a pencil and do it, and you'll activate the muscles that are required to pick up a pencil and lift it up. Uh, somatic, the somatic nervous system is often associated with the, a voluntary type uh, action. And again, that's usually going to be activation of skeletal muscles. Now the autonomic nervous system is not considered to be voluntary. It is considered to be largely involuntary. And the word auto is a lot like autopilot. If you're familiar with that term, autopilot means that you don't really have direct control. It's just automatic, it happens, you're not thinking about it, you're not aware of it, and you're really not able to control it. So the autonomic nervous system is responsible for things that you are not usually very conscious of and you can't directly think about it and go, oh, I wanna change this and go. So the autonomic nervous system would control things like the smooth muscle in your body. Now, what does the smooth muscle do? Well, the smooth muscle is gonna coat a bunch of tubes. So your digestive system, your blood vessels, that kind of stuff. You can't think and go, mm, I really wanna contract my brachial artery right now and constrict it. Smooth muscle, tighten, go, go, go. That's not a thing. You don't get to do that. Rather, sensory information is coming in about your blood pressure and other stuff. And if your brain decides on autopilot without you being aware of it, that you need to tighten up the smooth muscle around your brachial artery, it's gonna activate the autonomic nervous system to do that. And it's not something that you can voluntarily change or control. So the autonomic nervous system is further broken down into two uh, subdivisions, and those are called the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. So perhaps you've heard of them before. We'll get into them in just a little bit of detail here. So the sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system um, actually are also anatomically distinct. So if you uh, learn about this in anatomy, you'll learn that they come off of different areas of the spinal cord. Uh, they use what are called ganglia, um, but they tend to innervate, not, not the exact same organs, but uh, usually a pretty similar array of organs. The sympathetic nervous system is most often associated with fight or flight. So chances are you've heard of that before. I'm gonna deviate for just a moment and tell you an interesting story. In my uh, undergrad physiology class, I think it was maybe my third lecture, and we were starting to cover the nervous system, and I think it was probably, it must have been fight or flight day. And it was a large auditorium, it was two o'clock in the afternoon, nobody was focused. We showed up and all of us are chatting, so this is before cell phones when everybody's on their cell phone just texting somebody not in the room maybe texting somebody in the room, but we actually had to talk to each other. So we're all sitting there and chatting, et cetera. And um, the lights went out and then we all heard a gunshot, the big auditorium. And then the lights went back on. I don't really remember the lecture because guess what? My sympathetic nervous system was activated. Well, standing at the front of the room was the instructor holding a gun and he had just shot off a blank. So he had done it on purpose. Now, again, I'm old, so, this would never uh, fly today, given the fact that we've had a lot of school shootings. But back then, before school shootings were a thing, um, he was able to start his lecture that way. So he started the lecture by basically activating all of our sympathetic uh, uh, nervous systems. And then he started asking, you know, how do you feel? What's going on? And, okay, well, your heart's racing. You know, you're having trouble... Uh, 
uh, thinking about things like going to the bathroom. Maybe you were hungry because it's two o'clock in the afternoon and you were thinking about a siesta and now you're not, you're wide awake and ready to run or fight. I mean, we were all terrified. Again, I don't really remember much of the lecture because I don't think my heart rate came down anytime soon. It was very scary. But um, definitely, yes, that person activated my sympathetic nervous system. So the sympathetic division is referred to as fight or flight. And um, what it does is it activates your body to get ready to try to survive under all, uh, at all costs. Now, interestingly enough, a lot of people think that you must be presented with an acute, um, you know, extremely dangerous uh, event to activate the sympathetic nervous system, but it doesn't have to be acute. It could be kind of chronic too. So if you're under like a lot of stress, for instance, leading up to, oh, I don't know, the T's exam, then the sympathetic nervous system might be activated for a couple days, for instance. So again, fight or flight, it's kind of like a, you know, I'm in extreme danger. I must give whatever this event in front of me is that's causing me danger, all of my attention. So what are some of the things that happens to you in a sympathetic response? Um, the sympathetic response would elevate your heart rate. It would pump blood through your body faster. Your lungs are gonna open up to get more air. You're going to redirect your blood flow to areas that need it, namely your skeletal muscles and your brain. Um, whereas areas that don't need it necessarily like your digestive system are going to get less. Now the converse of that is the parasympathetic division. And the parasympathetic division is sometimes referred to as rest and digest. So this is what is usually dominant most of the time, especially if you're not overly stressed or exercising. And so this is you sitting on a couch, watching something, you know, easy going on Netflix, eating some food, and you're just kind of relaxed and you're thinking, I'm hungry. Ice cream sounds really good right now. I wonder, yeah, I do have to pee. And so those are all parasympathetic division, division responses. Now, I say this as if it's an either or, when in reality, they're kind of both fighting over the same system. So for instance, you'll see there's a line from both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system to your heart. And so the sympathetic nervous system elevates your heart rate, the parasympathetic nervous system depresses your heart rate, and they're kind of both fighting for control. It's not like just your parasympathetic is going or just your sympathetic is going. But if you're rested right now and you're able to focus on this and you're not too distracted, chances are your parasympathetic is gaining more control over your heart than your sympathetic and your heart rate is lower than it would be um, by default. So now that we've covered that, let's turn and uh, look at the cells of the nervous system. So most simply, we can break up the cells of the nervous system into two categories. We have neurons, and then we have something called glial cells. So neurons are going to get all of the press. In other words, when we tend to learn about the nervous system and we learn about the cells, neurons are where it's at. Everyone wants to focus on the neurons. Glial cells are often thought of as kind of an afterthought. In fact, the name is based in the word glue, the glue cells, the glue what? That keep the neurons together. So. <laughs> The neurons get all the press and then the glial cells are considered an afterthought, but we're actually gonna cover a few of the glial cells in a little bit of detail. But before we do, let's get started on the neurons. Now neurons uh, can actually come in a, uh, several different shapes. And in anatomy, you might learn about these like um, unipolar, bipolar, um, multipolar. But in this class, we're just gonna draw what is called the typical neuron and the typical neuron is a multipolar neuron. So what I'm going to do is turn the video over to my drawing pad, and we're gonna go ahead and draw a typical neuron and label the parts that you need to know so that we can move on. So let's go ahead and do that now.
In this neuron, we still have a traditional cell body or the center of the cell containing the nucleus and the other major organelles, but then there's all these extensions that come off of it. Where we have these multiple branching patterns that almost look like a medusa type pattern coming off of the cell body, those are called dendrites. The one long cytoplasmic extension that comes off the cell body is called the axon. There's a transition zone between the cell body and the axon. This is known as the axon helix. Sometimes it is also called the trigger zone. We'll be talking about that later. And then the axon is going to further branch off into multiple terminals that have like little button-like shapes at the end. These are called axon terminals. Okay, so neurons conduct electrical activity from one end of the cell to the other end of the cell. And so the dendrites are going to be taking in the information, processing it through the cell body, and sending that elect electricity down the length of the axon to the axon terminals. So the electrical impulses go from dendrite cell body into the axon and then to the axon terminals. Axons may be bare or they can be wrapped up in a special insulating material made almost exclusively of lipids called myelin. So I'm redrawing this axon as a myelinated axon and you can see the myelin wrappings. Those are called myelin sheaths. They are created by specialized glial cells that wrap up sections of the axon as shown here. And then there are always exposed spaces, and those exposed spaces are called nodes of Ranvier. This is where the axon itself would directly interact with the interstitial fluid that surrounds the axon. So in this class, we are going to be spending all of our time really looking at um, how the neuron conducts those electrical impulses. But before we start getting into the mechanisms that um, allow the propagation of electrical signals. Let's spend just a little bit of time learning about some of the glial cells. Now the glial cells again are going to be the supporting cells that are found in both the central and the peripheral nervous system. And again the name glial means glue. So you can see in this image that there's actually quite a few types of glial cells. The central nervous system contains more types than the peripheral nervous system does. We are not going to be covering all of the types. I'm just actually going to cover two. In the central nervous system, I want to cover oligodendrocytes, and you can see an image of that at the bottom, and then also astrocytes. The word astro um, refers to like astronomy, it means star. And of course, as you can see in this image, it looks like a star. So we're going to cover those two, and then we're going to move to the peripheral nervous system and cover something called a Schwann cell. Okay. So when we look at glial cells in the central nervous system, again, we have astrocytes and we have oligodendrocytes. I'm actually going to start by talking about the astrocytes. So we're going to learn a little bit about astrocytes. Astrocytes um, do a bunch of different things, actually. And if you were to Google the function of an astrocyte, you would see a phrase that re would read like, promotes the health of neurons. In other words, they keep the neurons happy, healthy, and functioning. But another um, important function of the astrocytes is they actually help neurons talk to each other. And what I mean by that is if you have a neuron and you know that information is going from here to here, what happens when you get to this end? Well, it needs to talk to another neuron if it's in the brain. So astrocytes help it plug into another neuron. So if you want to envision your brain as like a giant supercomputer, you could think of all of these little circuits where you're kind of plugging in different cords going, no, that talks to that and that talks to that. And astrocytes are doing that in your brain with neurons on a microscopic level. So I'm going to tell you really quickly um, another interesting little story about astrocytes. And this is one that is um, related to intelligence. So I don't think that a lot of people would dispute that Albert Einstein was very smart. And many people would call him a genius. So when Albert Einstein died, um, people were very interested in what made his brain 
genius level, you know, what was special about his brain that made him a genius? In other words, is there something anatomical that would govern intelligence? And so, of course, as I mentioned earlier, neurons get all the press, so the first thing they started looking at was neurons. Well, it turned out he didn't have an unusually high number of neurons. In fact, he had kind of an average number of neurons in the parts of the brain that would be dealing with things like mathematical equations. So this would be like the 1950s and people were really disappointed, like, ugh, we thought there was going to be something special here that would kind of give us the answer to cognitive thought and intelligence and they eh, threw it away. Well, they revisited this idea in the 80s and they started looking at glial cells instead of neurons. And what they found was that Albert Einstein had an unusually high number of astrocytes in the regions of the brain that are specifically uh, related to like mathematical thinking. So, hmm, unusually high level of astrocytes, as in able to form more neural connections, more complex pathways, more complex thought. So they started looking at whether or not there was a correlation between proportions of astrocytes and intelligence. And they looked across the animal kingdom and they took animals that you would expect would not be very intelligent, capable of complex thought, all the way up to humans. And they kind of predicted if this is true, that astrocyte proportion is related to intelligence, then we would expect to see greater numbers of astrocytes with more intelligent species. And largely they found that was true. And humans um, were certainly competing with number one, but were not the dominant, dominant species. Dolphins were. So specifically killer whales, I think. If I'm remembering correctly, I think it was killer whales. Uh, were competing with humans for the, the greatest number of astrocytes in their brain. So astrocytes also seem to have a function that is associated with cognitive thought, complex thought, and intelligence. Okay, so that's it for the astrocytes. Let's turn and take a look at um, oligodendrocytes and Schwann cells. Now, oligodendrocytes are going to be a certain cell type that is found in the central nervous system, but there is a corollary in the peripheral nervous system called a Schwann cell. They both do essentially the same thing, which is what's called myelinate the axon. So I have here the picture of the Schwann cell, so let's actually cover that and then we'll go back to the oligodendrocyte and then we'll be done with our lecture. So a Schwann cell is going to be a cell that is basically, if you think about cells, we tend to think of them as like blobs. Now imagine that I take a blob like cookie dough or something like that. So that's my cell. It's a, a big block of cookie dough. I'm going to lay it out and I'm going to roll it. I'm going to roll it until it's totally flat. And so that's kind of what happens with a Schwann cell. You take a Schwann cell and you flatten it out and extend it out so it's like a sheet. And you get rid of most of the cytoplasm and what you have left is just really plasma membranes like plasma membrane and plasma membrane and plasma membrane there's really not much left inside the cell it's just kind of this flat sheet of plasma membrane well you know that plasma or cell membranes of course are going to be uh, very lipid rich so lots of lipids phospholipids steroids etc and then what you do is you take that sheet and you wrap it around part of the axon as shown in this image so you can see that pretty clearly here. So this right here is the cross section where my cursor is the cross section of the neuron axon. Sorry, this is the cross section of the axon. And then you can see these are the, the layers of the Schwann cell wrapping itself around like a yellow brick road coming out of Munchkin land. And there's the nucleus there, but you don't need to worry about that. So what does that do? Well, because a Schwann cell is mostly just lipids, it creates a lipid layer called myelin over that axon. So what you see here in the peripheral nervous system is the peripheral nervous system will have a cell body, will have the axon, and then it will take individual Schwann cells that will kind of wrap themselves around the axon at different spots. And then there's always little parts of the axon that are exposed. Those are called nodes of Ranvier, and we'll be getting into the importance of that in a different lecture. But the myelin, of course, being very lipid rich, is going to um, repel water and other things that are soluble in water, 
like ions. And so this is going to be really important when we start talking about the conduction of electricity down the length of the axon. Because remember, the uh, public enemy number one for lipids is actually not water, it's ions, charged ions. They hate each other. So if you put a bunch of ions next to these myelin sheets, they want to be anywhere but there. And so that's actually going to be something important. Now, if you've been through anatomy already, then you would recognize myelinated axons as being white matter because it's shiny. So whenever you see white matter, those are going to be areas that are myelinated in uh, the nervous system. Now, oligodendrocytes are doing the same thing, but they are doing it in the central nervous system rather than the peripheral nervous system. So both the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system have the ability to what's called myelinate their axons with these specialized cells. It's just the cells that do it are a little different. In the peripheral nervous system, it's done by Schwann cell. And if I go back here, oligodendrocytes, and there's one oligodendrocytes, do it in the central nervous system. One difference you might note here is that the oligodendrocyte cell body tends to stay distinct from the axon and so it's more like they extend their cytoplasmic extensions and then curl their fingers around parts of an axon. So one oligodendrocyte can actually myelinate a couple different neurons in the central nervous system. Whereas in the peripheral nervous system, one Schwann cell gives its entire body to one part of one uh, axon. All right, that concludes our lecture. Thanks.